Ontology, The Waystation of Red Pill Sanity Written by William Leo Translated by Deep L and a Human Read for you by Eric, Jenny, Mia, and many other bots Season 2 Lords and Wanderers Episode 1 A World Lacking in Lords, Lords and Wanderers in China in my opinion, the style of this series of invited talks is a multimedia adaptation of Studs Terkel's book, American Dreams, Lost and Found. Millennials probably don't know who Terkel is, but he was a star author in the 1980s who took mainland China by storm. His relevance and appeal were to embody the formation of American history through the fate of ordinary people themselves. In the fashionable term of the time, it was the search for the American dream. Miss America, truck drivers, journalists, prostitutes. Everyone felt that oneself was an active shaper of America, rather than a passive spectator. I could easily understand Turkle's characterization. One thing is different though, the Chinese dream does not really exist. The so-called American dream is a stable consensus that runs through history and permeates across society, such as individualism, personal striving, a sense of protagonism by ordinary people, that sort of thing. There is no such consensus in China, and the Chinese dream is merely a cosmetic phrase, used for perfunctory purposes. The American dream is a platitude yet stable and effective. The actors are on and off the stage, while the plot remains the same routine, the fixed formula. The ideals and pursuits of these characters are so similar that I couldn't tell who was who. Even now I can't tell Arnold Schwarzenegger from Ronald Reagan. In the last 30 years China has seen the opposite, an illustration of the old saying from the Book of Documents, in men, one seeks such of old understanding, in tools, one seeks only the new. From the 1980s to the present, the actors are mostly the same mob, yet the values they propagate have flipped several times. Declaring war on yesterday's me with today's me, which was a maverick hallmark in Liang Qichao's time, has become a mass phenomenon today, with a strong speculative and cynical character. I myself am a witness, but hardly a participant. I don't know of any common Chinese dream and mentally have always considered myself as an outsider. Young as I was in the 80s, I could nevertheless sense the rustic progressive atmosphere of we love science in society. What some now call positive energy is actually a paradoxical confluence of pretentiousness and snobbery. My primary school principal at the time had a renowned aphorism that I have never forgotten, kids should eat more carbohydrates, not more sugar. At the time, only a handful of highly privileged university students and remnants of the republic knew that carbohydrates and sugar are the same things, so she wasn't particularly exceptional. It was the era of Deng Xiaoping's child prodigies in university and children's computer literacy, so the word carbohydrate was very much in fashion. In my mind computers had always been associated with science fiction and extraterrestrial beings. I had no idea that they would become an everyday gadget. Then, in the early 2000s, without even the faintest foreshadowing, returning students who had turned down well-paid jobs overseas falling out of favor and replaced by businessmen returning to invest in their own country. Then suddenly came the era of civil service fever and, filthy rich, let's be friends. I repeat, these are still the same lot. A Chinese scholar once said he knew a woman who worshipped comrade Jiang Qing during the Cultural Revolution in Wailing Hysteria and denounced her after the Cultural Revolution again in Wailing Hysteria. He was bewildered, how this person could have done it so naturally as if switching values were as easy as turning on and off a tap. I feel the same as he did, except that I am bewildered not by one or two individuals, but by almost everyone I know, or rather, the entire society. There is a saying by Confucius, where the wind blows, the grass bends, meaning whichever way the wind blows, follows the grass. This is how Chinese people are today. They have a memory that lasts only five minutes, hence live in a constant jittery and fidgety state. There is another half to that saying of Confucius, that is, the superior's virtue is the wind, the inferior's virtue is grass. What he meant was that the common people were supposed to fall with the wind and that values were instilled in them by the literati and officials. Human translators note, the literati was part of the ruling class and generally held official titles, appearing in the Tang dynasty when the imperial examination system was established and gaining a firm social position since the Song dynasty. Economically, they were mostly landowners, 
but the land was not a necessity. The literati were characterized by their knowledge and their Confucian upbringing, i.e. they were scholars. Because of their Confucian upbringing, they were qualified to enter politics through the imperial examinations. They were the backbone of society and the maintenance of order in the countryside, as well as the reserve army of the bureaucratic cadres. If we analyze this from a historical perspective, we will see that it was not complete nonsense. Although not entirely free of self-glorification, there is also something substantial behind it. Gentleman is the genteel title for the literati and Tu Hao, in Chinese, landed gentry, the cruder one. In the martial arts novel, The Legend of the Condor Heroes, Guo Jing, the fictional protagonist who was betrothed to Genghis Khan's daughter, was described as a local lord in the history of the Song dynasty. He did not die in the defense of Xiangyang as in the novel but committed suicide when the Jurchen soldiers invaded Hanzhong. Jun Yong, the author of The Legend of the Condor Heroes, depicted Lu Wenda brothers, the historical defenders of Xiangyang, as useless wimps who relied on Guo Jing's assistance. But the history of the Song dynasty tells us that Lu Wenda came from the same background as Guo Jing, and that their whole family was a landed gentry. The so-called Tu Hao were virtuous social elites who had embraced the basic values of Confucianism. They had money and power, but did not hold official positions. Of course, this was not necessarily the case. Lu Wenda ended up as an official, and his army was called the Lu Family Army. Guo Jing, had he not died, would probably have spent the rest of his life much the same as Lu Wenda. The key to a landed gentry was the word, landed, and his strength could not be separated from the attachment to his native land and his neighbors. He had stable and consistent allegiance and was, therefore, a stabilizing and solidifying force in society. Human translators note, for English readers, it might be easier to refer to the figure of Boaz in the Hebrew Bible, a community leader well-versed in and faithfully practicing his community's laws and customs, commanding tremendous influence and respect. The history of the first half of the 20th century is the history of the decay and demise of the landed gentry, a process that was in fact the demise of traditional China. With the fall of the landed gentry class, the wanderers suddenly took center stage. They were the kind of people that Mencius disliked, such as Su Qin and Zhang Yi, who had no fixed affiliation and lived on political speculation. The Republic was the era of the opportunistic wanderers, the era of Yang Du, Liang Qichao, Li Dajiao and Chen Duxiu. Many people are nostalgic for the Republic because of this, and Xie Yang's books and Yang Kuisong's book, The Unstoppable Care, all belong to this category. The authors put themselves in the shoes of these wanderers, eating their hearts out that they had not been born at the favorable time. The real problem is that it does not really matter what these wanderers do. They wouldn't have succeeded anyway because the booming of wanderers is the equivalent of maggots crawling out of a corpse. The maggot's task is to accelerate the decomposition of the corpse before destroying itself. The presence of the wanderers is a sign of the destruction of the old civilization, but not the cause. They have no capacity to recreate civilization, yet they repeatedly overestimate their own importance. The Spring and Autumn Period and the Warring States Period a period in Chinese history from approximately 771 to 221 BCE. Saw the destruction of the feudal system and aristocratic civilization. The occurrence of contention of a hundred schools of thought, otherwise known as the golden age of the Chinese philosophy, was in fact a symptom of the debacle. The culture of the wanderers continued into the Western Han dynasty, hence the propagation of the motto, those who serve the world do not care about their families. These wanderers without attachment conquered the old aristocracy such as Xiang Yu and Tianhang, who could not survive without their community, and were themselves short-lived. It took centuries of consolidation for the Confucian literati to finally fill the vacuum left by the feudal aristocratic community. The new China, what we today call, traditional China, slowly produced its own gentry, characters like Sima Yi and Zhuge Liang. They were the solidifying nucleus of the new society, regarding sustainable values, that is, the Tao or the Way and henceforth the hundred schools of thought were no longer necessary, heaven changeth not, likewise the Way changeth not. At this point, the wanderer retired from history. Anyone who abandons the family community loses his or her identity and becomes unprotected by law. The stability lasted for over a thousand years before collapsing again in the early 20th century. Yen Fu said in 1905, 
today is a time of great change not seen since the change of the Shang dynasty, and I cannot foresee the end of the story. Indeed, when we see the top scholar, title conferred on the one who came first in the highest imperial examination, Zhang Jiji and Sichuan landed gentry Liu Wenzai come to the end of their road while Zhang Shizhao, a speculative strategist, and Nan Huijin, a political broker, have their bread buttered on both sides, we should beware, we live in a time of propriety disintegration and iconoclasm, and we are besieged by wanderers of all sizes and shapes. Tu Hao is not unique to China, any stable society has binding nucleuses equivalent to the Boaz figures or landed gentry. The more organic the landed gentry is, or the stronger their attachment to the communities, the more stable the society is. The fundamental structure of American society did not change much from the time of Washington Irving, through the time of Mark Twain, until the time of Robert Frost. It has a very small group of Bosian figures, consisting of pastors, judges, primary schools principals, doctors, plus a few socially responsible entrepreneurs. Local affairs were essentially run by these people. When Tom Sawyer wanders off, Judge Thatcher calls the parents together to find him. Huckleberry Finn becomes homeless and the judge and the vicar find a foster mother for him. Robbers rumored to be on the prowl, the same local elites organize patrols of sturdy men. Community self-government is not a game for atomized individuals, it requires the coordination of a core of highly homogeneous local elites to function. Without community self-government, the U.S. Constitution would be merely empty talks. The homogenized nature of the American landed gentry relies on Protestant ethics to sustain it which for centuries has seen only minute modifications. What is civil society? In such a society there is some kind of organic symbiotic relationship between society and the landed gentry. You can see figures like Ko Wen Chi in Taiwan as proof that their civil society already exists. He is a doctor, not an intellectual or an ideologue. He has made good contacts among the citizens of Taipei and has accumulated enough social influence to challenge the two major political parties. In the 1960s, when the social commentator Li Ao owned the publicity show, Taiwan was still a wanderer society. In the 2010s, when Ko Wen Chi was firmly entrenched, Taiwan had become a society of tycoons. The wanderer society is sensitive and fragile, and the slightest stimulus will change its trajectory. A gentry society is sluggish and stable, able to resist great pressure, and only wears off slowly. A time without the landed gentry is a time of transition when the dust has not yet settled. All the strong bonds are fraying and society is turning into quicksand. It is a golden age for intellectual wannabes and mercenaries of the mind, but the good times were certainly not long in coming. Most people couldn't bear to live without discipline and direction, preferring to be guided by others rather than drifting aimlessly. Saul Bellow wrote a novel, titled Dangling Man, that depicts this mentality. The protagonist is originally very reluctant to be drafted but the inspection drags on too long and the state of limbo is unbearable. When the army finally does come for him, he feels relieved to go instead. This is how it is with many fugitives, for whom it becomes easier once they get arrested. As terrible as punishment is, the unknown is worse than the punishment. In fact, the real fear of man is uncertainty, just as a child fears the dark. Imagined dangers are the most frightening, once they are realized they are not so frightening. For example, civilians who have never been to war always consider soldiers very brave. The soldier himself often does not feel that way. To him, war is just a series of trivialities. Most of it is just a series of chores such as camping, eating, and distributing equipment. Firing guns, digging trenches, dodging bombardments, and so on are all technical procedures that are experienced much like a driver fixing a car, and death is only an accident. The army was a regulated society, dangerous but not scary because everyone knows, what my superiors would do, what my subordinates would do, what my neighbors would do. A quicksand society is the opposite, where everyone is an opportunist without principles or purpose. Anything can happen and predictability completely dissolves. In my own case, as long as it takes longer than six months to cash in, I take the word of anyone as a whisper. Whatever flip-flopping happens, would not be surprised at all. Only middle school students and hypocrites make a fuss about it. There are plenty of rich and powerful people in society, all similar to Liu Han and Wu Ying. Saying he is good and saying he is bad is all a matter of one mouth.
Thank you for listening. This is a podcast series produced by Luminous Society. Luminous Society provides you with an alternative historical narrative.